Welcome everyone to today's Edison Electric Institute webinar, a conversation on Africa's role in the making of the modern world with Howard French. My name is Alekia Malavarupu, and I'm an analyst for international programs at EEI. Today's session is part of our virtual conversation series, where we sit down with global experts and discuss the issues affecting our industry. We are honored today to welcome Professor Howard French to EEI to reframe world history and guide us through the past, putting Africa and Africans at the center of the origins of the modern world and discuss the region's future potential with regards to the energy transition and the creation of new value chains. He will be joined in conversation by Dr. Lawrence Jones, Vice President for International Programs at EEI. Throughout the session, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature. Lawrence will aim to incorporate as many of them as possible into the conversation. Without further ado, I will turn this over to Lawrence to get started. Thank you, Alikia, and welcome everyone. Hi, Howard, welcome to EEI. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Alikia. It's, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Well, Howard, first of all, let me start by congratulating you on the book, uh, Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans and the Making of the Modern World. An excellent book, and I highly recommend this to others who would like to get a pretty good insight on the history uh, of the transatlantic slave trade, but also just to understand issues that have been avoided in uh, history for, for now. I think to start, Howard, I'd like to begin by just asking you to tell us about how the book came about and also how long did it take you to write the book? Uh, thank you, that's a good place to start. Um, uh, there's many possible answers to this question, uh, which I get asked quite often, but the two most important threads or strands or, or points of origin for me relate on the one hand to my personal biography, my actually my biological origins, and the other one is more career related. So in, in terms of the biological uh, piece, um, I am uh, the child of a very particular uh, story with roots in slavery. My grandmother's grandmother uh, was the um, favored slave of uh, a peer and friend and ally of Thomas Jefferson in the state of Virginia, a man named James Barber, who was an early governor of Virginia and secretary of war and occupied various other important posts in, in early American uh, government history. And he was a slave owner, and he uh, had a child by one of the women whom he owned named Priscilla, who was an ancestor of mine. And I grew up with this story in my household, um, and it was very important to sort of the formation of my ideas about the topic of enslavement and what it means for our country and what it means for the world and, and the many processes that, are, that go into enslavement and, and the, the things that feed from enslavement that mostly get undiscussed among us. Um, we just take as a sort of passing fact that there was slavery in the past without usually dwelling to think very much about it. And then I guess the most other significant other thread is this uh, career experience that I had uh, as a New York Times correspondent for many years, working in the four corners of the Atlantic world. I was based in West and Central Africa twice in my career. I worked uh, based in Latin America and the Caribbean uh, for a significant period of my career. I'm of course from the US South with a family whose roots are in Virginia. And so that's, you know, part of this Atlantic Basin story. And I speak several European languages and have spent a lot of time traveling in Europe. And so this book really, as I, as I, as I worked as a journalist traveling this Atlantic world, I drew on the many threads that seemed to become tangled the more I learned and tried to, tried to extract meaning from them. And uh, thinking also against the backdrop of, of familiar slavery, as I said, um, this book uh, is kind of a, a, the result of reflections on those themes. So we're going to get into the book in more detail. And what I found fascinating, Howard, is that um, <clears throat> you know you take us through so many different parts of the transatlantic region, and we're going to try to tackle some of those uh, places you visited and some of the interesting uh, individuals that you cover in the book, which typically you don't hear about in terms of uh, in terms of the, the age of discovery, for example. So we're not going to talk about Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama. Uh, we're going to actually talk about other people who perhaps had an even greater impact uh, on, on, on the region. But before I get there, you've traveled to 120 countries. 
how how did those travels affect your ability to sort of a uh, keep an objective view when writing the book because it's very easy to sort of bring your experiences from those travels into this kind of a well-researched book i think the more one travels and the more one experiences the more one has a basis for observation and comparison and contrast and so i don't think that uh, the unusually abundant amount of travel that i've done in my life has hindered my ability to 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 be objective i think it has in fact given me some more perspective about things and uh, one of the stories i tell that actually relates to your first question also is how some of the ideas to this for this book came together when i was based in east asia as a correspondent for the new york times uh, hearing the way contemporary east asians in places like japan and china discuss uh, world history and how it came about that the world that the west at a particular point in time begins to ascend and ultimately diverge in terms of wealth and power from the East. And they ask themselves questions about what it is about the historical experience of the West that made this possible. And what is it about the historical experience of their own countries that made this possible? These kinds of questions, which are, which are current, as I said, in East Asia, actually uh, tweaked my um, awareness of this history and made me, prompted me to go further in thinking about things that most Americans or most people in this hemisphere don't actually necessarily spend a lot of day-to-day -day time thinking about. Yeah, so you, you spend a lot of time in the book. I think just that the book is about the contributions made by Africa and Africans in terms of making a modern world. So for those who haven't read the book, and I encourage everyone to get a copy and read it, what would be two or three key messages you would like them to take away before we get into the book? Sure, I'll, I'll offer you three messages. Actually, I could give you four or five, but let's, let's see if I can keep myself <laughs> disciplined. So the first one goes back to your mention of Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama. I actually do think we have to mention them. the normal story that we all start learning in grade school, at least in this country, is if, whether or not this term is used, I think the narrative I'm going to describe will be familiar to you. And that is that the modern world begins to come together with Christopher Columbus's quote unquote discovery of the Americas, right? This is the beginning of modern history as we are commonly taught it, right? My book makes the claim that actually the modern world begins to come together at least a century before that through initiatives taken by African rulers in particular in a kingdom called Mali uh, in the early 14th century to travel, uh, by, uh, to undertake pilgrimage to Mecca and stopping in Cairo, a, a very powerful ruler of that era uh, from Mali dispenses with 18 tons of gold and acts of patronage throughout the Middle East. And that this enormous display of wealth and of patronage uh, depresses the price of gold for more than 10 years in the, in the larger Mediterranean world and sends messages into Europe about the existence of huge wealth in West Africa. So the normal story about Columbus is, uh, you know, Africa is completely cut out of the history. And it's all about, there's an obsession among the Iberians about discovering a maritime route to Asia. In fact, for a century prior to that, they were completely wrapped up in connecting with Africa because of uh, their awareness of a powerful empire that controlled enormous amounts of gold. And so this sets in motion exploration, especially by the Portuguese, who are a very poor, weak, and young uh, dynasty uh, to connect with these sources of gold. And the Portuguese search throughout most of the 15th century, meaning from the early 1400s until the year that's mentioned in the title of my book, 1471, when they finally make their way all the way around the sort of long Western bulge of the West Af of the African continent and, and, and arrive in what we now know of today as the nation of Ghana. And there they discover a, a, a super abundant source of gold. And this um, makes Portugal for the first time in its history, a wealthy, prosperous and viable kingdom that can hold its own against Spain. And then finally, finance the more famous acts of exploration that we all know about, including Columbus, including Da Gama. And so Columbus, in fact, interestingly, Da Gama as well, both worked for the Portuguese in this era that the textbooks tell us nothing about. They were ferrying gold and supplies back and forth between Portugal and what we now call Ghana for two decades prior to Columbus's effort to discover the Americas. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say, and I'm trying to go quickly and compress this, right? Because we have limited time. But the second thing, the second great act uh, 
uh, that is cut out of con con most sort of conventional accounts of the last 500 years, let's say the modern era, is that not long after the Portuguese discovered gold at Elmina in Ghana, they discovered the island of Sao Tome. And on the island of Sao Tome, just off the coast of Central Africa, it was uninhabited. It's located right near the equator. It's a volcanic island with incredibly rich soils and abundant rainfall. The Portuguese begin to plant sugar cane there, and they discovered very quickly that this was, ecologically speaking, perhaps the best place they had ever seen for growing sugar cane. It was incredibly fertile. The only thing they lacked was labor. And so the Portuguese at Sao Tome invent a new economic uh, system of, of, uh, of production, which is incredibly innovative, but is also horrible. So we don't usually think of innovations necessarily as being horrible things. That usually has a positive ring to us. But this is the most important economic innovation in the modern age prior to the Industrial Revolution, in my view. And it is, this is the invention of the prison industrial labor camps that we usually euphemize by calling them plantations. Plantations and large-scale slave-driven agricultural commodity production takes form in a mature way in Sao Tome for the first time in history, this little island. And Sao Tome, and, 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 and with the additional feature of what another innovation that we know of under the name, many of your listeners will be familiar with this term, chattel slavery, where people were identified on a racial basis in this instance, Africans, as uh, legitimately eligible for subjection to slavery. And they were brought from the African continent and put to work in these new industrial labor camp settings that we call plantations, and sugar production was eked out of them at the lash. They were militarily supervised, and they were forced to work, and their lives were ground out. They would work to death. Typical life expectancy was five to seven years in these places of production. This model then transits the Atlantic very soon after this. So it's invented in Sao Tome. Most people never hear about this in world history. It transits the Atlantic. The Portuguese discover Brazil. They transplant this new production method to Brazil. And Brazil ultimately becomes the largest slate site of enslavement in the entire world in the modern era, when millions of Africans eventually are brought across the Atlantic to work under precisely these sorts of conditions. So the next thing that happens in the 1630s, we've, we've moved ahead now in time, the English who had been bit players in empire up until that point, um, settled the island of Barbados. Barbados is one third the size of the city of Los Angeles. And at Barbados, the British, I'm sorry, the English, Britain didn't exist yet formally, the English copy the methods of the Portuguese and begin bringing enslaved Africans under this chattel institution to work in these prison industrial labor camp settings on tiny Barbados to produce sugar. Sugar was an extremely rare thing in the world at that time. It was an exorbitant luxury in the courts of Europe. Only the kings and, and, their, and their closest associates could afford sugar. And in Barbados and a little bit before that in Brazil, this new labor and production model using enslaved people under chattel turns sugar for the first time in history into an abundant commodity that everyone in Europe from the high to the low can afford to have in their diets in abundance. And this, we don't have time to get into this particular piece in any great depth, but this revolutionizes life in Europe. Um, people begin to drink coffee eventually oh. in the workplace instead of drinking ale during the day. People drank ale in this age during the day because um, hygienic water was not available. And so you couldn't give your workers ale because they would get sick. Um, I'm sorry, you couldn't give them uh, water because they would get sick. So people drank ale instead. Now, suddenly, by virtue of this prison industrial labor camp system, you have uh, hot beverages. The heating of the water makes the water hygienic. The caffeine and the coffee makes it a stimulant. The sugar makes it palatable and gives free calories. This has incredible side effects in terms of British society. Ultimately, in fact, as I argue in the book, this ends up helping create the newspaper industry. Newspapers are born out of this because coffee shops spring up in the 1650s as a result of all of these products arriving uh, in Britain or in England. And then clever entrepreneurs begin to sell 
uh, broadsheets or printed newspapers for the first time, newspapers had not existed, to the captive audiences of people lingering, drinking stimulating beverages in coffee shops. We can come back to that. The third thing I want to bring to your attention, <clears throat> finally, is the, um, so you see a progression of this new institution of the prison industrial labor camp and the commodity production that this resulted in from Sao Tome, tiny little place to Brazil, a huge place, to Barbados, yet another tiny little place, and then up the chain of the Caribbean islands, and finally to the place that we know of as Haiti today. But back then was divided between Spain and France, and this French part was known as Saint-Domingue. And in Saint-Domingue, this same model of production using chattel slavery is employed beginning in the 1730s to grow sugar on a large scale on behalf of France. And by the latter quarter of the 18th century, Haiti, slave-grown production from Haiti, constitutes one-third of all of France's external trade. This is the, the, the precise era of France's uh, rapid rise in terms of wealth and power in the modern age. And it is driven by this extraordinary windfall uh, taken from the expropriated labor of Africans in these prison labor camp systems. Something incredible then happens, and I'm gonna wrap up in a second. This has been a long answer, but in 1791, the Africans who had been brought to Haiti to labor under these circumstances of chattel slavery rise up in rebellion. Uh, and by 1804, they win their freedom. In order to win their freedom, they defeated the three great imperial powers of the age. An incredible story. First, they defeat the, the French. It was a French colony. When the French uh, uh, were defeated the first time around, the Spanish stepped in, hoping that they could take over the French colony and keep the Africans in slavery. The slaves beat the Spanish. Then the English, by this time known as Britain, came in, hoping the French and the Spanish are knocked out of the picture. Opportunistically, we can take over Haiti. The Haitians beat the British. Then the French came back and tried to defeat the slaves in their uprising and were in turn defeated under Napoleon. And this nearly drove Napoleon into bankruptcy. And in 1804, Haiti proclaims its independence. It's victorious, its Africans are victorious. They create the first nation to arise out of a successful slave revolt. They create the first instance of the full real realization of the most important values of the enlightenment, namely that all people are created equal. This was in their constitution in 1804, regardless of race, language, color, or origin. We in the United States didn't achieve this really in effect for quite some time afterwards. So we think of the enlightenment as something that came from Europe, but the, the Haitians were the first to institute this. Final thing happens. When the Haitians victoriously um, create their new uh, nation, their new republic, um, the, old, the, the plantation owners in the Old South in the United States, especially Virginia, but also South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, et cetera, they take fright. They think that if Black people freshly brought from Africa could defeat the three greatest imperial powers of the age in a place like Haiti, well, maybe this is um, this could be fatal to us too. We need to dilute the concentration of Africans that we have amid, among our midst. And so Napoleon, almost driven to bankruptcy, sells <clears throat> uh, out of economic urgency to the Jefferson administration, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, all or part of what would become 15 American states. The United States doubles in size overnight as a result of the Haitian Revolution. And the Thomas Jefferson administration initiates the transfer of huge numbers of people of African origin out of the Old South into the Mississippi Valley for, because they fear of uprisings in the Old South. And in the Mississippi Valley, this prison industrial labor complex is reproduced yet again. But instead of growing sugar, these enslaved peoples are put to the production of cotton. And cotton then succeeds sugar beginning in the 1790s and accelerating all the way to the American Civil War as the most important economic product by far of the young United States. It is the biggest export that the United States has in this age by a very long distance. This is not even controversial, right? And it all grows out of the prison industrial labor complex. Final, final point. It is their product, the product of this prison industrial labor complex, the good created by slave labor extracted from them at the whip, 
cotton, which is the basis of the industrial revolution in England. There could have been no industrial revolution. We think of the industrial revolution as a result of European cleverness, of ingenious inventors who figured out how to organize work uh, in England, producing specialized looms and organizing workers together in factories, and that this is the start of the takeoff of the modern world in the industrial phase, right? We cut out of the story that none of that would have been possible without the extraction of labor in equally industrial circumstances, namely via the plantation in the Mississippi Valley of millions of people who descend from Africa. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really filling the gap of something that I think is very, very, very important. I want to just, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the individuals in this very, very interesting story. Just give a bit, tidbit information on why you think they're so important that you included them in the book. Let's start with Mansa Musa. Talk about him very briefly, and then we'll walk through a few of these individuals in the book who you normally don't hear about, but Mansa Musa. Sure. I, I, before I get into the details of Mansa Musa, I think I have to add, answer part the general part of your question, why it's important to talk about these figures. And Mansa Musa is a very good example. So we typically think of Africa as being an inert place, a place without historical interest, without any special achievement, not capable of doing things of its own, never having a strategy or long-time designs or agency in the world, right? And Mansa Musa, in the very beginning of this history, is the exact opposite of this. So here's a man who, as I said, in 1324, sets off uh, with an enormous procession of people and 18 tons of pure gold to Cairo and to Mecca in pilgrimage. This was not just an act of extravagance where he was trying to impress people. This was an act, this was a geopolitical gambit by Mansa Musa, who is trying to break to help his kingdom, Mali, in the Sahel region of West Africa, break out of a long-standing pattern of dependence on middlemen in North Africa who served as the conduit for his country's or his kingdom's trade in gold with Europe. And so as middlemen tend to do, they would cut a big piece of the profit out of the Malian trade. Mali was mostly landlocked. And so Mansa Musa in 1324 says, if I can go to Egypt, and uh, uh, make the Egyptians under the Mamluk dynasty there aware of the enormous amount of gold that I control, I can diversify the sources of my trade and break out of the, the sort of stranglehold that Mali had historically been locked into under uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, at the hands of the North, North African kingdoms. Um, and so this is initiative. This is geopolitical vision. This is African agency. And this is not just to make anyone feel better that I mention all of this, but, but this set in motion the history that I've just been talking about. The Europeans learn about uh, the existence of enormous wealth and of civilizational strength in West Africa. The Portuguese make a very long-term bid to try to connect with all of this. And all of the other things that we're familiar with, including Columbus and Da Gama, flow from those events, right? And so this isn't a gratuitous attempt to put Africa into the center of things. It is an attempt based on the real story, on the facts, to place Africa in the picture and at the center of the picture in this particular age where it really deserves to be. Mm, interesting. Um, so we've, we've talked about Mansa Musa. Uh, there's a question in the chat regarding Vasto Gadama and, and Batano Diaz, but we get back to them. I want to go to another figure in the book, and, and that is uh, Antao Goncavales, who I guess uh, met uh, or captured the Black Morris. Why was that an important incident to, to talk about? So Antao Gonçalves is a, one of the early Portuguese disc, uh, explorers. Um, and so when, when I say early, what I mean is in the early 15th century under the aegis of a Portuguese prince who we know of commonly as Henry the Navigator. Henry the Navigator is the person in Europe who picks up on this story of wealth in the Sahel because of Mansa Musa and says, Portugal needs to be the first country to, com to connect with that wealth. And we're going to have to do this by sea because crossing the Sahara Desert is too difficult. And there are hostile Muslim kingdoms in North Africa between us and West Africa. And so let's do this by sea. And so you see this is a very different origin of modernity story than we have typically of an obsession with the East, right? And so Henry the Navigator um, 
initiates a series of voyages down at great cost for a weak and poor kingdom that Portugal was down the coast of West Africa, trying desperately. They don't have a precise idea where the source of the gold is or where the seat of the Mali empire is. But so they're going inching down the, the West African coast. And in the beginning, <clears throat> Well, actually, more than the beginning, for the first decades, they're not finding lots of gold. And Portugal being poor, there uh, arose a debate in the royal court in Portugal about whether this was a good idea, economically speaking. Look, we're sending these ships down the coast. It's costing us money. We're constantly fighting wars for survival against Spain, which wishes to reabsorb us. Um, why are we wasting money sending people down the coast of Africa? And the answer that Henry and his men came up with was, be patient, we will eventually discover gold. But in the meantime, we can sell human beings. Mm -hmm. And the sale of human beings, and Gonsalves fits into this story because he's one of the first instances of this, did not mean across the Atlantic. The Europeans had not been across the Atlantic yet. It meant selling human beings into the marketplaces of Southern Europe. Europe had just recently, a generation prior, had been hit by the Black Death. One third of the population of many of these countries had uh, disappeared uh, by, because of disease, and Europe, Europe was desperate for manpower. And so the Portuguese, in this early part of their exploratory bid to connect with Africa, are trying to capture people, uh, you know, unfortunate small bands of people or individuals they could find wandering around the coast of West Africa for shipment back into Europe for sale. And this is how they begin to, this is how they manage to finance this seven decade long bid to connect with the sources of gold in West Africa. Gonçalves was one of the first captains, uh, ship captains to, to, to do this. And just to sort of buckle this question, um, this, Slave trade prior to the discovery of gold and prior to the discovery in Africa and prior to the discovery of the Americas by Columbus, which lay in the distant future still, this, this trade in slaves uh, or in Africans who were enslaved becomes quite important. Uh, in the 1500s, so many Africans were brought to Europe that 10% of the population of Lisbon was eventually African. 10% of the population of the city of Seville eventually in Spain, eventually became African. So that gives you an idea of the amplitude of this phenomenon. Eventually, the Portuguese came to understand that it was easier for them uh, and more profitable for them to trade and certainly safer in human beings by finding uh, highly organized African societies along the coast and negotiating uh, trade with them rather than raiding communities of defenseless people because you raid some village or something like that well you may have armor and whatnot but your some of your men may be ambushed or or killed uh, whereas if you develop negotiated trade with more organized societies which the Portuguese eventually did you could scale up this trade and so there was a transition in the years after the person that you asked me about Gonçalves which concentrated Portugal's efforts in making diplomatic and political connections with African kingdoms along the coast, not Mali, but coastal kingdoms to organize a trade in human beings. So basically what we have here, Howard, is we have gold, human slavery, sugar, cotton. Those were the commodities, if you may, that made up that era in terms of, if you want to call it critical, critical commodities of, of, of that time, right? Uh, we'll come back and talk about, if you put it in contemporary terms, the critical minerals of today and how that ties into what's happening now. But let's just talk about one other figure and then we'll get into a few places that you've, you've visited as we put this book together. I'm intrigued by Eric, Eric Williams. In mm -hmm. Barbados, let's talk about. Well, he's from Trinidad, but, Trinidad. but let's talk a little bit about Eric Williams and, and how he fits into this whole story. So Eric Williams, as you said, was a, um, a man from uh, from Trinidad, all the way in the very extreme southern Caribbean, who um, arrives in uh, England uh, in the 1930s to pursue a doctoral degree, uh, and he ends up attending Oxford, uh, and he develops a thesis, which says essentially that the um, uh, um, uh, ascension of Britain as an economic power in the 18th century uh, was uh, largely an effect of the profit that Britain obtained through the slave trade. Uh, now this set off an, enor an enormous, you can only imagine how conservative uh, um, elite uh, 
British educational institutions like uh, Oxford and Cambridge would have been in the 1930s. This, so it's, it's remarkable enough that he was able to get his thesis approved. Later, this becomes a book um, called Capitalism and Slavery, um, uh, which has become enormously influential across the decades, but it took a long time for its arguments to penetrate because most of the intellectual energy in Britain prior to its publication was aimed at debunking it. And I, I take on uh, uh, this, I, I, I give an account of this period in the book because there's something really, really striking to me about it. What is striking to me about it goes beyond the pertinence of Eric Williams' argument. But <clears throat> the fact that in the 500 years history that we are discussing here today, almost no European effort prior to Eric Williams had ever been invested in understanding how important enslavement and the products of enslaved people had been to the rise of Europe. No European scholars had ever paid any attention to that of any um, uh, worth mentioning. No emphasis had ever been provided to this. And so here comes this um, uh, uh, black man from Trinidad who goes to an elite European institution, an elite in British institution, produces a thesis about this, and you see this enormous outpouring of intellectual energy not aimed in the initial decades after the publication at considering his arguments in a positive light, but in trying to debunk them and to discard them and to categorically deny them. Uh, and, and, and I just find this uh, astounding uh, on the face of it because even to a layman, it seems to me that without doing any sort of specialized investigation, it should not seem unusual that slavery operated in this trans transatlantic kind of context that we've been discovering on the scale that we know it to have uh, operated on should have been super important and perhaps instrumental to uh, the rise in, in wealth of, of Europe. I mean, it just... It's, it seems so obvious to us today. Uh, and yet the, 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 the weight of denialism was such that it took decades before Eric Williams' arguments uh, began to receive a respectful uh, consideration in the sort of halls of elite uh, British and subsequently American educational establishments. That's finally happened. And so in my book, I try to resuscitate some of Eric Williams' story and to consider the elements of his arguments that I think are right and wrong. I don't think he got everything right, by the way, but I think in a big picture sense, it is in fact indisputable. Uh, and this is a central piece of my book that the wealth of the West came, flowed from the enslavement of millions of Africans. Let me make, let me take that even one point further. So we throw this word, the West around really lightly. It enters our daily conversations in so many ways without anyone ever, or rarely anyone ever pausing to consider what do we mean by the West? When I say the West in the context of the arguments I'm making about ascension and divergence from other parts of the world and wealth and power, I mean the Atlantic facing parts of Europe and uh, the Anglophone speaking parts of North America. These two ge geographical, geopolitical spaces have been integrated uh, over the last several hundred years and enslavement and the extraction of labor for millions of Africans is the thing that made this condominium between the Atlantic Europe and uh, continental North America possible in the first place. Why possible? Until the year 14, I'm sorry, 1820, four times as many people were brought from Africa across the Atlantic than from Europe. Your listeners need to really listen to this, hear this number. Four times more people were brought from Africa prior to 1820 than from Europe. It was the labor of those Africans. It was the exploitation of those Africans that made North America viable, economically speaking, and therefore made possible uh, the creation of a hugely profitable economic and political condominium between Atlantic facing Europe and, and the wilderness of North America. They transformed the tales we tell ourselves, of course, cut this out of the story. We have, you know, homesteaders and, and Western movies about, you know, bravery and courage and settling the West and all of this. The, the foundations for the settlement 
and the economic viability of continental North America were laid by the sacrifice of these Africans. Yeah, and there is a question in the chat about where one can get a copy of uh, Eric Williams' book. I would suggest first that they read your book before reading Eric Williams' book, which perhaps might make a little bit more contemporary reading. But uh, I, I want to move on now. And, and obviously, you, you've you traveled to a lot of places, uh, Howard, in, in preparing for this book. Uh, one specific place I want to just touch on briefly is Barbados. And, and this walk us very quickly through your experience in Barbados, because in a book, you talk about a couple of very interesting discoveries or lack of discoveries in Barbados, including Mr. Drake, Drix. So can you just say a few words about your Barbados, your Barbados experience and how, how that was important in your research and writing of this book? Sure. Um, so you mentioned the name of Drax and the Drax family, uh, a man named uh, with the surname Drax was one of the um, first people to arrive from England in Barbados in 1630. Uh, and uh, the first arrivals also happened to uh, be able to make the claim on the most fertile land in Barbados. And so Drax becomes one of the big sugar farmers in the very beginning in Barbados. Uh, and it's not just a matter of having arrived first, but he was clearly a very clever man and uh, you know, came to understand how to employ this Sao Tome model of prison industrial labor um, uh, slavery uh, uh, in, a, in a very highly efficient way in Barbados. And he becomes enormously rich. Uh, and so I visited the, his, the ruins of his plantation uh, in the highlands of Barbados and toured the surrounding uh, sugar fields that he once owned. Uh, there's no real monuments to any of this or signage anywhere uh, uh, noting this. And so this put, put me onto the path of, of another idea that's sort of central in the way that I tried to write the book. And that is as I wandered through these landscapes in many of the countries that I described, uh, I was struck above all, in fact, by just that, by the absence of commemoration. So we are in a phase in the United States of a great deal of contestation between left and right, if you will, about um, the degree to which it's appropriate to pull down the statues of people who are associated with horrible events in the past, and most notably uh, support for the Confederacy and for, for the enslavement of people of African descent, right? Um, put that aside. Uh, think for a moment of how many of you who are listening have ever encountered a monument to Africans or the descendants of Africans who were killed through these processes. Any kind of commemoration of the wealth and prosperity that derived from the sacrifice, actually liter literally the life sacrifice of millions of these people whose, whose um, uh, subjugation uh, in the charnel houses of the Caribbean or in the plantations of the South created the economic basis for, for this condominium that I'm calling the West. There's an absolute or near absolute lack of commemoration. So pulling down statues uh, of villains, if you will, is one thing, but the creation of an appropriate landscape of monuments for people whose sacrifice, in fact, is, the, is, is an, a, a vital basis of our common prosperity today is a whole nother task that needs to be done. And so I was struck as I traveled in lots of places in most of the countries that I visited in the research of this book, but to take your example of Barbados, Barbados, a black ruled republic, right? Um, but one that doesn't have a whole lot of prominent monuments. Uh, and so I found myself searching for a, a site that was reputed to be the largest uh, burial grounds of African slaves in the Western hemisphere. Uh, and it, because of the lack of signage and, and, and sort of monuments, it took me three days uh, uh, using GPS and asking locals and wandering literally through uh, overgrown fields of bush and things like that until I could find this spot. Uh, and I spend a few moments in the book describing that experience and, and kind of collecting myself nearly overwhelmed late in the afternoon by just the, the sensation of having, of standing in a field where hundreds of people had been buried anonymously, having been worked, literally worked to death to produce sugar. And as I stood there, the sun sort of declining in the Western sky at that moment, surrounded by actual sugar fields. It was just a, a, a real moment of connecting with the reality of what had transpired there. 
And that's what I like about the book, Howard, because you, you actually visited almost every site that is mentioned in the book, more or less. And, and, and that gives the reader a certain feel of being there as you describe some of your experiences. And I'm not going to reveal everything here because of time, but I really recommend that for the reader to go in and, and, and experience your trip to Sao Tome, for example, and, and sitting there to get on that airplane to go to Sao Tome from Portugal, that whole sensation of being almost like being back in the sort of a, the same route that was being used by by the, the Portuguese uh, back then. We have about 15 minutes. There are a couple of questions in the audience uh, from the audience. I'm going to try to uh, surmise them here, but but I just want to get into one thing. If you can just quickly comment in the book, you reference Bob Marley and you specifically talk about the redemption song for those who know Bob Marley and the phrase there where he talks about emancipate yourself from mental slavery. How difficult is that process after centuries of slavery? And I'm tying that to a question in the audience, I mean, in the chat from uh, a gentleman, Lamin Savadoga, who talks about, you know, this whole process of us dealing with the past and recognizing the contemporariness of what's happening. How difficult is that mental slavery to be, a, to be sort of a diminished uh, from, our, from our, our, our livelihood, so to speak? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, Bob Marley is a real hero of mine. Um, uh, it's easy to kind of write him off as the uh, author and performer of, of kind of light and happy songs. But if you get to know Bob Marley's uh, complete body of work, uh, perhaps half of his catalog really dealt with deep historical issues. Uh, and they have to, the songs and the lyrics have to be listened to repeatedly to sort of allow the full weight of what he's talking about to sink in, right? Um, the Caribbean, again, it's hard to sort of for somebody today, uh, given what the Caribbean represents to North Americans as essentially a, a, a vacation, tropical vacation destination, right? The Caribbean was the cockpit of the world economy for three or 400 years. The Caribbean was the most important source of wealth for Britain throughout this period. India which receives much more attention in sort of traditional studies of British empire was a late comer to the scene in terms of Britain's rise, economically speaking. That rise was founded on sugar and slavery in the Caribbean. Uh, so much wealth was created in the Caribbean. As I said, that France was the richest colony in the history of the world. A third of, uh, of France's external trade came from one little place that we know of as Haiti today, right? If you think about Jamaica, the per capita income of Jamaicans in the 18th century, white Jamaicans in the 18th century was 30 times higher than the per capita income of white Americans in that same period, right? Which gives you a sense of the, the, the extent of wealth creation that was, that, that, was, that was driven by slave labor and these industrial prison labor uh, systems that we've talked about uh, here today. Um, Bob Marley's phrase that I use and quote uh, with such respect and admiration in the, in the book, uh, free yourself from mental slavery, involves overcoming the kind of sustained ignorance that we have about this history of actually using terms like the West without thinking about what the West involved or, 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 or consisted of, or thinking or, 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 or sort of thinking of slavery as this thing that we must duly note in passing as an item in history and important perhaps somehow to our past, but never really bothering to learn about it. Um, that's, that all constitutes, uh, these all constitute elements of what I think Bob Marley would, would characterize as mental slavery. Another feature, Bob Marley, in, with a phrase like that, I think is specifically speaking to people of African descent throughout the diaspora. And the thought here is, don't allow yourself to be balkanized psychologically, spiritually, historically. Don't get caught up in little micro chauvinisms that I'm most uh, essentially uh, a Jamaican or a Trinidadian or a Liberian or a Ghanaian or an African-American. Uh, it's fine to hold on to those things, but not at the expense of understanding that all of these na nations and nationalities have a foundation behind them. They mm. connect at the root to a far deeper and far more important and powerful story. And that is the story of the creation of the modern world that's at the heart of this book. 
a lot of questions coming in now, and I knew we we're going to run out of time, but I'm just going to throw a few at you. So, by the way, I want to definitely thank the coming in from uh, by Biden. Uh, Biden, I've known Bobai for many years. I haven't seen him for a while, but he apparently, uh, actually, his father knew uh, Eric uh, Eric Williams, and and mm -hmm. by. Uh, has a has a autographed copy of Capitalism and Slavery. So so I'm happy that this this webinar brought the two of you guys together, and hopefully you will meet one day. Just quickly, uh, there's a question here, uh, Howard, uh, asking for you to just say a few words about Haiti. I know we've talked about Haiti already, so I don't know whether we want to get into that a little bit more uh, about what Haiti meant for this for the region. Um, anything else you want to add briefly about Haiti that that might sort of help to frame the conversation? Well, when I talk about Haiti in many of my book talks, I'm faced with a common question, and I don't take offense at the question. I don't think it's an absurd question. Uh, sometimes it sounds like it's asked with a bit of a, an edge to it, but often just it's a, a sort of ordinary question. And the question is, if Haiti is so great, if these Haitians could have beaten three of the greatest imperial powers of the age in succession, and in fact, beat the French twice. If the Haitians had lived up, had been the first to really fulfill the most essential value of the enlightenment, as I have said they did, and which I think is indisputable, then why is Haiti such a mess today? I get asked that question a lot. Um, you have to understand, uh, one has to understand, um, uh, many more of the details in Haitian history to get a full appreciation of this. One of them is, that Haitians were brought together from disparate parts of Africa on purpose. White people, the colonizers of Hispaniola, which was divided between France on the one hand and Spain on the other hand, were afraid of Haitian, I'm sorry, of African um, uh, concertation and rebellion from the very beginning. And so they had a strategy, bring people from totally different parts of Africa with totally different cultures and totally different languages and religions and drop them here. And that way you can forestall any sense of unity among them. So the, the Africans achieved enough unity to rebel, as I've said, and to overthrow their um, enslavers and to create a new republic. But that doesn't mean that they had a, 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 a the leisure to develop a national culture and national history in, in a peaceful space in, 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 in time, as most countries do, right? Uh, their country was born in an emergency in the most, under the most traumatic circumstances with people brought from Africa with no kinds of, uh, you know, there had been no institution aimed at education or any other kind of public service intended for these people. And so they started from less than zero. So that's the first piece of the answer. Second piece of the answer is um, the major powers of the West were afraid of the example of Haiti. The Old South moved slaves to the Mississippi Valley, as I described for you, because they were afraid of the example of Haiti, that Africans in Georgia or Virginia would then rise up, seeing that Haitians had succeeded and taking their courage from that, right? Um, and so the response of the Western powers in this era, and for a very long, into the 20th century, was to quarantine Haiti. In other words, to deny it economic, I'm sorry, diplomatic recognition. And in the case of France, to impose an indemnity on Haiti, to say that if you ever wish to resume normal political relations with us and to have us uh, recognize you, you have to pay us billions of dollars. And so Haiti was isolated deliberately to punish it for its success for many decades after the Haitian Revolution. And this prejudiced the origins of the Haitian state and crippled it in lasting ways and, and put it behind the sort of eight ball in terms of its development, politically speaking, et cetera. And so I think this is the background to understanding that question in the appropriate way. This is great. I think we're gonna, we, we have time for a few more questions to round things up here. But before we get to what I call the contemporary aspect of this book, Howard, which is trying to put it into this context, when you think of gold, slave, sugar cane or sugar and cotton, and you think of the critical minerals needed for the energy transition in the world today, there are some parallels we don't want to think about in terms of how do we avoid making mistakes from the past. But before we do that, just quickly, uh, we haven't talked about the trans-Sahara slave trade. I know you couldn't copy every, cover every aspect of slave, slavery in the world in the book, but can you just say a few words about the whole trans-Saharan slave trade? Because I think it's an important aspect for people to keep in mind. Sure. Um, I speak briefly about this in my book. Um, I did that for a couple of reasons. One of them is because uh, 
the trans-Saharan slave trade is a different phenomenon from the transatlantic slave trade, but indisputably an important phenomenon and a phenomenon that involved that lasted for a very long time and involved large numbers of people sold into slavery from uh, sub-Saharan Africa into what we call today the Middle East, especially places like Oman uh, and uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, and, uh, places, countries in that uh, region. Um, uh, but I did so in a protective way also, anticipating, um, protective in quotation marks, anticipating a sort of snide question for that uh, I've uh, see one sometimes hears when one talks about the transatlantic slave trade. And that is, oh, listen, other people enslaved Africans too. In fact, Africans themselves engaged in slavery. So why, is, why, is there, why does there deserve to be such a focus on this, right? Uh, I did not want to open myself up to somebody making the ridiculous claim that I'm denying that there had been other forms of enslavement. Exactly. The, I, my book is about the creation of the Atlantic world. And yeah. from the creation of this Atlantic world with connections drawn from the four continents that I've described, we get the origins of the modern world. So I'm not, this is not a history of slavery writ large, right? Um, but there's another point, excuse me for being long again, but that needs to be said. And that is, I wouldn't want to be a slave under any circumstances, nor would I want you or anyone I know to be a slave under any circumstances, right? However, there was a qualitative difference between the type of enslavement operated across the Atlantic, which we call chattel slavery, and where people were put to, into bondage in these prison industrial labor centers that we prettify by calling them plantations and other kinds of slavery that have existed in history. And that is not to prettify, to repeat that word, slavery elsewhere. However, enslavement in the Middle East across the Sahara was not chattel slavery. These people were not put into plantation work they were not condemned in eternity, meaning across generations, that the children of slaves would become slaves and the children of those slaves would become slaves, et cetera, et cetera, on and on ad infinitum, right? These are unique features of chattel slavery. And indeed, if you look at the royal houses of, the, of a country like Oman and even Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and some of these other um, kingdoms, you will see black people in those um, families, in princely titles, right? That's unimaginable in a chattel slavery system. And that doesn't mean that being a slave for most slaves was a good thing, but that does mean that the color line was a permeable barrier and as opposed to an impermeable barrier, which it was by design under chattel. Good, good. Well, towards the end of the book, Howard, you talk about the impact of population. And that's just why I want to end this conversation. And I want to tie... <laughs> The population deficit that Africa had back then, the population surplus you made that Africa has now because the population in Africa is booming. Uh, tie that then also to the critical minerals we have in Africa, which is essential for the world, which are essential for the world transitioning to cleaner energy. And the need for work to get done to, you know, to get those resources, to make them available. How do we make sure going forward that the work being done in Africa is done in a way that we do not perpetuate uh, slave labor, for lack of a better word. Today, we have a lot of discussions around ESG, where environmental social governance to make sure that uh, everything is done in a way that is environmentally friendly and socially just and all of that. But we know that in Africa, there is a huge demand for African resources. We have a lot of different governments and countries trying to play there. So how do we make sure learning from your book, learning from history, what do we do to avoid generations of Africans to come to find themselves reading a history that talks about slavery in Africa in the year 2022, 2023 to exploit resources to make this world a better place at the expense of Africans? So how do we learn from the past and design a world going forward that is more equitable in terms of the work being done by Africans to have Africa prosper? Uh, thank you. Uh, so there are a lot of sort of components to this question. Uh, and the first one involves the past and the demography of Africa in the past and the impact of slavery. I'll try to, to deal with that quickly. Um, I argue in my book that roughly 30 million people uh, at a minimum 
were extracted from Africa for the purposes of trade, the trade in human beings across the Atlantic uh, for the purposes that we've talked about, this prison industrial labor system, right? Um, this was not spread evenly across the 350 or 400 years of enslavement, right? Um, uh, there, the, the, the high point, the most intense period of slavery overwhelmingly was the 18th century, okay? Uh, and so uh, I argue in the book that the demographic impact of extracting most of these 30 million people, so 12 and a half million were landed alive in the new world, and the remainder to get you to the number of 30 died before they reached the new world, whether they died at sea or whether they died at, on the land in Africa via conflict fueled by the slave trade or by disease fueled by the chaos created by the slave trade or whatnot. Um, the, the disappearance of those numbers of people against the backdrop of a continent that in the 18th century is believed to have had a total population for the entire continent of 100 million people is an extremely important effect that is usually not considered when we think about the horror of the slave trade. So most of the 30 million people, if my number is correct, disappeared in the 18th century. And in the 18th century, Africa had a population total of 100 million people. Think of that. Uh, everyone you knew, uh, the average person would know somebody who was lost to slavery or the processes that drove slavery. That's how widespread the damage was. Okay, so you said, uh, I think, uh, in passing that Africa today may be overpopulated. I think that's a contentious idea. I don't particularly personally believe Africa is overpopulated, but I do believe Not that Africa- Not overpopulated, but populated more than it was back then. So maybe I missed- Oh, it. for sure, for, for sure. Uh, incontestably, right? Mm -hmm. um, Africa, much of Africa's population growth, in my view, has been a kind of catch up or a rebound uh, yeah. from, from the damages that we've seen th through enslavement, right? Um, yes. But Africa is undoubtedly the scene of the most dramatic population change in the world today. Africa is about 1.4, 1.5 billion people today. Africa in the middle of this century, which is, which is actually quite near, is projected to be, and I think reliably projected to be, about 2.5 billion people. Africa by the end of this century, neither you and I unfortunately are likely to be here then, but by the end of this century will be somewhere between 3 and 5 billion people. Even the low end of that range is more people than China and, in, and India combined, okay? So Africa is the scene of the most dynamic change in the human population by far, right? The, the, the incremental growth in the numbers of new human beings in the world population is overwhelmingly concentrated right now and will be for the next several decades in Africa. This should impel us together, all of us, human beings, wherever we may find ourselves, to find ways to integrate Africa into the world economy much more than it ever has been before. Uh, because if we fail to do that, if Africa is not given the opportunity to integrate itself more, much more deeply in the world economy. So when I say much more deeply, I mean to industrialize and I mean to enter the service sectors of the world economy. In the future, what can we expect to happen? We cannot expect, what we cannot expect to happen is that three to five billion people will sit still and content or peaceful in a continent where there is insufficient economic opportunity. And so Europeans are trying to, I think, quite wrongheadedly today, sort of create a, an idea of, for immigration purposes, fortress Europe, like build the walls really high and try to keep the Africans out that way. I think this is a, an illusion. They are deluding themselves that when, when Africa's population, continue, as it continues to grow at the pace that I've described, there will be no holding back the human tide. The only way to hold back the human tide is to allow for and to facilitate the introduction of opportunities in Africa to enter service in a big way, to enter industry in a big way. You have spoken about minerals. Africa can no longer, if we are to avoid catastrophe in terms of global migration and environmental destruction, Africa can no longer be allowed simply to be a place of extraction of minerals. The minerals have to be processed there. That's the only way that Africans can partake in the adding added value that will 
create prosperity on the ground in Africa and will give Africans incentive to remain in their countries and will create viable countries out of their nations. Same thing is true for commodities that Africans grow. Africans can't can be expected to continue growing cocoa and coffee uh, and various kinds of oils, palm oil and the like, and tropical flowers and this and that, right? Just for simple export to Europe or to the West, or for that matter, to China, which has come online as a big trading partner in recent years, right? The processing of these goods finally has to be transferred to Africa. The transformation of these goods has through industry has to take place in Africa in such a way that by adding value, and creating profit in Africa and greater industrialization in Africa and higher wages in Africa, that Africans are given an incentive to remain rooted in their own societies, that African countries are made much more viable and, pros and prosperous, that they are integrated into the global economy as full participants in the global economy and not just as structural, let's call them subalterns. I wouldn't say slaves, but perpetually relegated or confined to a low station in terms of the chain of production that we expect from, from, from all of these goods. And I think pretty central to that transformation, if I would be a little bit selfish in my remark, is the need to have access to energy and access to electricity. And that's where the work we do at Edison Electric Institute uh, aims to sort of a promote electrification around the world and aims to promote access to clean energy uh, around the world. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation as part of EEI's celebration of Black History Month. Uh, before we end, Howard, uh, the book again is Born in Blackness. Uh, uh, I, I like to ask this question to every author and I'll ask you that same question, Howard. What is the next book project? Because I would like for you to commit that when that book is released, you will come back to EEI and be the first place to talk about that book. But what's the next book project? Um, thank you, Lawrence. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate your interest in the book and that of that of your audience. And you reached out to me uh, uh, several weeks ago already, and I've enjoyed the conversation that we've had. I also applaud your idea about energy. Finding energy solutions for Africans is going to be a key to the future. Africans are consuming uh, minuscule amounts of energy. The accessibility to reliable electricity is very low on average on the continent. And this is gonna be a key piece in keeping Africans rooted in their own countries and making viable economies out of their nations and in creating opportunity for Africans. Um, my next book, uh, I don't have a title yet for you, but I'm at work on it already. It picks up where this book ends. So in the subtitle of this book, it says from 1471 to the Second World War. My next book picks up at the end of the Second World War with the beginnings of decolonization. Uh, and decolonization, we don't usually think about it this way, but decolonization as a phenomenon is especially centered in Africa. This is the, the geographic space where the largest collection of colonized nations existed and where decolonization was most uh, prolific and intense. And so I'm going to pick up with uh, the story of how Africans arose out of a second kind of slavery, if you will, the enslavement of the colony, uh, and began to build independent nations and struggled with the precise question you asked me earlier of how to find a, a viable station in the world economy and how to find uh, their footing in a, in, in a difficult, competitive, often hostile world. So this begins this, this era the era of the new book begins in the Cold War. And so when I say hostile world, that sort of conjures a little bit of the idea of what I mean by that. But so this is without revealing too much, this is the, the general topic of the new book. And, and I can promise you already, I'd be, be happy to come back. Well, thank you so much. Let me apologize to the audience. We ran a little bit over, but I can show, I assure you that you, you enjoy this conversation. The book again is Born in Blackness, Africa, Africans in the Making of the Modern World. Our guest has been Howard French, Howard, thank you so much. And to the audience, I say, have a good day. I'll turn it over to Elika, who will say a few more words before we end. Thanks, Howard. Thank you, Lawrence.